Wow. It's a girl. <laughs> My mother has come. Wangu is a mother of a very handsome, brilliant young man called Derito. And as it's pretty obvious to you, <laughs> she's going to be a mother again soon. She is an accomplished Toastmaster. She's got much, much better English than I'll ever have. <laughs> And she's gone beyond the levels I think I'll reach to. She's got an MBA. And we have spent many precious moments together competing over Scrabble, doing Monopoly, Sudoku, senior crosswords. She loves numbers. And today, she's my colleague at work. She's the chief operating officer of UPO, a profit consulting firm which we founded together. My father says that he received a worthwhile return on his investment. <laughs> you see, he paid for my MBA in France. Later on, he had the chance to receive bride price after drawn out negotiations. <laughs> and he says, I am particularly glad that this was just the first installment. <laughs> My father always dreamt of becoming an engineer. I brought him a son-in-law who actually is an engineer. <laughs> my interest in my husband grows every day. My father's rate of interest in my husband grows with each passing moment. <laughs> Therefore, I am certain that any expectations of future installments have been discounted by the power of compound interest. <laughs> but this story begins in an emergency village in Nyeri district. About 60 years ago, in the thick of emergency, I was literally living in squalor. The emergency village was actually like a concentration camp. It had a big trench surrounding it. It used to be closed. All the gates used to be closed between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. I had Jiga infested feet, and my hair was white. It was a nursery for lice. <laughs> but that was not an experiment. All the boys in the village was li were like me. <laughs> One day, as we were playing, the most educated man in the village stopped by. And he got me out, gave me a 50 cents coin. That was like 5,000 shillings today. You can imagine the impact then. I was so excited. I ran home because I knew my mother was going to be overjoyed. And I knew that the least you do would buy me some sweets. Surely, she was delighted. Her face lit up. 
And then I had a very searing pain course through my body. She was beating me. <laughs> I thought she actually wanted to kill me. Then I learned that my benefactor was actually my father. You see, my father had decided to go on with the school instead of marrying her. Then I went to school, and my mother did everything possible to play the role of a father. At the slightest infraction, I used to be severely punished. The reality of it all was that I was short on everything including pocket money. <laughs> so when I went to high school, and I got into the habit of smoking, I couldn't afford to buy a cigarette. So what I did was to buy a matchbox. <laughs> My craving for finances grew as my loathing for the absence of a mother, a father escalated. And I decided I wanted to be an engineer because I had learned that engineers were the best paid employees. When I left high school, and before the results were out, I was admitted to the Kenya Institute of Administration for accountancy. Then I learned that within two years, I would be earning more than a graduate. So I stuck. <laughs> By the time my high school colleagues were graduating, I was the first Kenyan to get the final certificate of CPA. Two years later, we started agitating to have legislation to recognize CPA as the benchmark accounting qualification for Kenya. That was about 1975. One of my co-campaigners was Professor Godo Wakariyoki. Towards the end of 1977, he invited me to his wedding. And there I spied a, a starry eyed girl who was the best maid. <laughs> when I was introduced to her and I looked at her, I got hooked. And she locked me. <laughs> she took my heart. She squeezed all the air out. <laughs> and held it on a string. A round of applause for Jean Jerry Washira. <laughs> for the next four years, I had no air. <laughs> On the 19th of December, 1981, very exhausted, she gave up. And said, I do. So we had a roller coaster of a honeymoon, and for the following year, I had complete, absolute romantic love. <laughs> On the 1st of November, 1982, Wango <laughs> made her 
royal entry. <laughs> my princess, my mother. Now that she's a mother, I can tell her. She actually took a bit of sheen from the romance. <laughs> Muregi, her brother, followed soon after, a very, very noisy boy, <laughs> who took a lot of attention from his mother. That used to give me some time to be with Wango, because for intents and purposes, I was irrelevant around the house. <laughs> So I immersed myself into other things, including work and the profession. And Degwa followed after that. But I also discovered one thing, that the love between children and their mother is different from the mother's side. All the other people become secondary of secondary interest. <laughs> and that group included me. <laughs> so as we moved on, I went up, you know, I got engaged in the profession. And in 1995, I reached the pinnacle of the accountancy profession. I was elected the chairman of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. From 1955 in the village, Jiga invested with the white hair beyond, before my, my time. And now, in 1995, I was chairman of accountants. Then it hit me. This was God's journey. It was not mine. I never knew that there was accountancy. Actually, when I was in the village, I thought that white people never used to go to the washrooms. That was emergency. <laughs> of course, we never thought about independence. And even the old ones, and as children, of course, we knew, yes, that that was our lot. We used to be happy, though, because we didn't know anything else. And so I realized, you know, that that was the situation. And us... I continued possibly to reflect on it and to reflect what has happened through that journey. I also realized that love can also be very painful because as my mother was punishing me, she wanted me to be compliant. But a lot of times, as a child, I felt that she really wanted to kill me. That particular day when my father gave me 50 cents, it was like intense, the most intense love being given 50 cents, <laughs> the most intense love being given a hiding that even today I remember. So, I knew that if there is something that a child looks forward to, it's a mother and a father. It is important to be there. But more importantly also, is that it is not the plans that we make. Because God has got a plan for every one of you. And they get many dreams. I dream being like Bill Gates. I dream about having a Learjet. I dream about being like Usain Bolt. Yeah. 
But one thing is that when you got dreams, you think about something. And therefore, as you go through life, and you come across things that are relevant to your dream, you connect. If you don't have a dream, you see things and you pass them by because they are unimportant. And it encouraged me to let my children dream. <laughs> my wife is a very serious educationist, so sometimes she doesn't agree with me. I definitely can't argue with her. <laughs> So I just love her. <laughs> and I say, it must be God's plan that these things are happening the way they are happening. I never heard the story of my grandfather until we began to prepare for this speech. It was unspoken. And so I only knew that my grandmother had established a business and brought up her four children by the work of her hands. Since then, I have learned that the absence of a father in my father's life determined the decisions he made to bring us up in a family that loves each other, that feels the presence of a father, and knows that anything is possible if only we dare to dream. Today, I've been here, I've listened to excellent music. My mother made sure that I would never take music as a business. <laughs> She sent me away from her caro, her choir. Today, I don't have to be a musician for money. Next time you see me here, I might actually be playing music. <laughs> I bought a guitar. I've had the first lesson. Jean, I haven't told you that yet. <laughs> and my teacher has assured me that there is even voice engineering or coaching. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my, my children have been good. They have given me a lot of joy. I used to lift this girl up. I, she wasn't like uh, this, of course. <laughs> They like business, so at the end of the day, we have converged into business, we have converged into creating wealth. I love wealth, I love people, I love connecting people with wealth. <laughs> and I believe that that is a good lesson. I've had, you know, a lot of acknowledgements because of the absence of a father. I would have wanted to go back to my father and tell him that God made all these things happen. When I reconnected with him, he told me he wanted a book, Devil on the Cross, which I gladly bought. By the next time I met him, he was in hospital. And he went away. So, like John said, there is love. But the environment is created by God for reasons which are much bigger than we will ever fathom. Thank you. Charles Kettering, the renowned engineer and holder of 186 patents, stood a two out of three chance of becoming my father. 
He was an engineer and he was a businessman. <laughs> but in 1977, he would have been 101 years old, which meant that it would have greatly reduced my chances of taking the sheen out of any romance. <laughs> I love my father, and a lot of people say that we have a great re relationship. I thank God for that every time I can. But now that I know his story, I appreciate even more the fact that he chose to do what he had not seen any other man do for him, and he did not falter in fatherhood. As a result, and by default rather than by design, our life paths have been uncannily similar. He got kicked out of the choir by his mother, my grandmother, who also cut short my dreams of an athletics career. <laughs> he loved numbers. He wanted to be an engineer. I loved numbers and wanted to study aeronautical engineering, but purely for the love of money, I chose to study actuarial science instead <laughs> and brought home an aeronautical engineer as his son-in-law. My father married a woman he had met at a wedding. I married a man I had met at a wedding, and we had our children one year later. When I was 25, my father allowed me to start a business. I was still working, but he put money in this business and graciously watched it crumble after six months. <laughs> At the age of 30, when I asked him if I could join him in business, he welcomed me with open arms and gave wind to my wings. Four years later, we have a staff complement of 10, and our client portfolio is at least half a billion shillings. This is not because I am a man. I still believe that we grew up in a highly patriarchal society but because my father chose to believe in my dreams and to let me do the things that he thought I should decide for myself, I was able to work in government and finally decide to follow him in the path of entrepreneurship. It hasn't been easy, but every time I have made a decision, he has stood by it, even if he knows that I will regret it at some point. The only things that he tried to get me to do were one, to enroll in a tennis class. My father believed that I could be Serena Williams, even after my grandmother found me in the last batch of girls running cross country in high school. <laughs> but he didn't say it to my face. He didn't say, Wango, I would like you to play tennis. He said, you know, if you play tennis, you will develop a firm handshake. So I chose to develop the farm handshake anyway, <laughs> and he has been the greatest beneficiary. I believe my capacity to give a farm handshake to people has made them believe in my capacity to deliver, even if they have not seen the quality of my product. He did also try to get me enrolled in an accountancy course after my high school, but I chose to study secretarial studies instead. As design would have it, and by God's perfect plan, we have ended up working together. Growing up, one of my favorite memories of my father is having him hoist me into the air, and his eyes would light up to my chuckles and much to my mother's chagrin. <laughs> Today, as I see my son running to his grandfather to be hoisted up into the air, to his chuckles and his grandmother's chagrin, <laughs> I am convinced that I am blessed and I remember to count each of my blessings. And so I thank God for my father who gave his children a reason to dream. For my father-in-law who left a legacy 
that I see his sons chasing after every day. I thank God for my husband who has believed in my father's dream and allows me to chase after my dream of becoming a successful entrepreneur. And for my son who has two generations of fathers who have left and continue to leave indelible footprints in the sands of time. As I close, I'd like to leave you with the words of Billy Graham, who said that a father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unappreciated, and yet one of the most valuable assets of our lifetime. Papa, thank you for being a man who set an example and taught me what to look for in the man who would eventually marry me. I love you and I thank God for you. Thank you.